Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the GoDaddy Pro Meetup uh, Wednesday. What is the third? Uh, today, we're covering a topic called what is website security? It seems simple, uh, and in many cases it is if you follow best practices, but you can dive a little deeper into that. And uh, to help us do that, uh, we have Victor Santoyo here. Victor is Securi's senior account executive who joined in 2015, uh, and his main responsibilities over these nine years with Securi has included uh, helping agencies, web professionals, and businesses of all sizes secure their web properties. Uh, today, Victor's going to discuss the ins and outs of website security, including using good security practices as a website owner to help yourself and your clients and your entire web environment uh, to be as clean and safe as possible. And just a, a, a very warm welcome to you, Victor. Uh, as I, we were saying before the event here, we've known each other for quite a while, uh, run in the same circles, and I've learned so much through you, uh, from you uh, through the years. Uh, so I'm excited to uh, see what you have to share today. And uh, for everybody listening, uh, we're going to go ahead and record this. Uh, we will have this in our wrap-up uh, uh, session, so you'll get an email if you if you couldn't join us today. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go off camera, off audio, but I'll be here, and I'll also be in the chat if anybody has any questions. Uh, so, Victor, feel free to take it away. Absolutely, sir, and thank you for the warm sentiment. It is mutual. Um, hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen here uh, to kind of provide some visual guidance into the topic, right? What is website security um, for, a, you know, I think for a group proportion of people, some understand it to some extent, others avoid it at all costs, I fully understand. Um, but I think one of the things that we'll kind of run through in a little bit, and I'll speak to what our main takeaways are, kind of just good takeaways, questions to be asking, maybe some uh, easy habits to start, you know, practicing and uh, mastering to some extent. Um, now, having said that, of course, as uh, you know, I mentioned, um, Victor out of the Security brand, um, that's my Twitter handle if one wants to follow me, although not only do I share a lot of security uh, items and news as one might imagine, I'm very much into the sports realm as well. So if you care for a uh, piece of that in your day to day on Twitter, then feel free to follow. But uh, more importantly, what are we here for? So like I mentioned, we're gonna go through some of the what, whys, and hows of website security. Why is it important? Um, who does it impact? And as I mentioned, we'll go through some security practice that you can take away and perhaps even share among others. Um, I think a lot of these practices sometimes can extend beyond the scope of your website, meaning just navigating the web online, you know, day to day at home, but uh, we'll cross that bridge as we get there. Now, of course, most of us get online, try to establish as much of a presence as possible, right? We want as many people trying to consume whatever it is that we have on our plate to deliver, whether that's news, whether that's funny, whether that's uh, video streaming or just general good guidance or blogging you know, of your own personal experiences. Either way, we want people to come, feel welcome, feel like they have a reason to come back. Now, in a lot of those cases, what often does get overlooked in those in the, prepar in the preparation of your site going online, being that exposed, is website security. You don't know where to start. You don't know exactly what you're looking for or what to avoid and how to get there. And I'm hoping I can shed some light or at least provide you the initial foundation of getting those answers. What is website security? Well, in essence, it's simply the ability for you to protect your website um, or your web application, as some refer to it, by being able to detect, prevent, and respond to these online cyber threats, right? So do we know there's a problem? How are we preventing the possibility of this problem? In the event that there is a problem, how do we respond? Do we have a plan in place? Oftentimes we meet, personally meet with a lot of organizations over the years that have no answer to one or all of these questions, right? So we're gonna kind of touch on the fact that at the end of the day, I think we all get very self-conscious about that fact that we do not wanna see, for example, this come up when we're trying to have people visit our site, right? It's, it's that implicit trust that we're trying to establish at the beginning of your site going online. Um, you don't want anyone coming here and then thinking, well, this particular URL seems very fishy, dangerous, you know, very, very suspect. 
um, why am I going to come back the next time? No different than seeing a very odd email pop into your inbox, start associating an email address that you'll just flag a spam, you'll never go back to it again. Same thing goes here, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's a visual shock and an alert that you never want because then it, it hurts you, the, the brand of what you're trying to accomplish. So what are some of the things that, you know, kind of get to this point, right? How do attackers out there do this? Couple things. And before I kind of go down the list, one of the things I will also say, because often people ask, is it's not often personal. It's never one specific person or a group that's targeting, let's say, your site, among others. In most cases, especially over our findings over the years, a lot of these attempts and a lot of these you know, successes from the attacker's point of view are often automatic. They're bot-based in nature. They grab a large list of domains that don't have any coherent thread within each other, but simply because they're online. Maybe they're sharing a similar platform, WordPress, of course, being the most popular. Um, and so oftentimes that just ends up being one of those things where you just happen to be utilizing a tool that a lot of other people for very different reasons are using. Um, so it's never a personal thing, but there are, but just keep in mind though, that there's always going to be the potential risk of something like this happening. So how does it happen? Well, for one, of course, this is really primarily about how much access these attackers or these you know, um, bot-based attempts have. A lot of times they access your email, which then makes it extremely easy for someone to just start going in and around, resetting passwords, and just getting access to all forms of things. Um, of course, this does not, not be something that would just simply be limited to say access to your cPanel or access to your FTP, but could be other more personal home-based uh, uh, you know, websites and uh, accounts and stuff like that. Uh, your computer, your device, your phone laying around without a lock uh, mechanism in place until someone goes through, similar thing, establish some form of access, and then they have another avenue in which they can gain access to say, you know, areas of your website or your your server, whatever the case may be. Um, the, you know, the browser you're using might be very outdated uh, or maybe allowing a lot more than it should. So perhaps, uh, someone kind of captures you going from another website that was vulnerable, you know, going through the, a browser-based vulnerability that they've taken advantage of, and now remote access to your machine may be in play. Um, of course, the, the way data is being sent, you may be visiting a site, again, not properly secured, not running over HTTPS, meaning the green padlock there in the browser. So the data that you may send to this particular website is vulnerable to what's known as a man in the middle attack. Otherwise, someone in the middle waiting for this information to just kind of pass through the river and just kind of grabbing it as they go to save for a future attempt. And of course, the security of your environment, meaning is your server up to snuff on all the updates? Is it locked down? Meaning, you know, are only certain people permitted to access the server in whole, certain directories, right? Roles and, uh, um, are really important in a situation like this. So these are just some of the ways that this happens, right? This is literally just someone trying to get access in. This doesn't even account for how new vulnerabilities evolve over time, meaning like you, you download a very uh, an unused plugin or a theme that hasn't been updated in four years. These are just very common. And again, these are things that kind of go beyond just the security of your website. You know, something like your computer or device being left let's say as you walk to pick up a coffee at a shop or whatnot, um, it can be a moment of opportunity for these types of people. So, okay, we know the, the hows of some of how this happens. What do we need to do in terms of securing or at least putting ourselves in a position to succeed, right? Um, so how do they get in? Well, of course, we touched on your hosting account, making sure you, you know, two FA passwords reset on a, semi-regular basis, right? I do so every 90 days or so, where um, I help, I utilize a last pass list that I gather, trying to understand how often back I recently reset a password and then just kind of keeping that up to speed. Um, control panel, of course, again, the C panel, the VHM, you know, whatever you're utilizing, um, making sure those are also secured down to, you know, uh, connected to a device for multi-factor, or only given access to so many people. People often, I see 
share usernames and passwords in the open in an inbox email or whatnot. Um, that can be, you know, a bit detrimental as well. You know, even open in a Slack channel where a bunch of other people in your organization may see it that may not necessarily have a reason to see it. Uh, of course, uh, other ports on the server, you have FTP, SFTP, SSH. Um, one of the things we sh uh, we typically recommend, especially with a you know, connection like SSH is um, locking that down and then only permitting certain IPs to connect, right? Uh, you know, your, your CMS management, right? So if you're utilizing WordPress, your WP admin, your administrator panel, if you do, you're leveraging something like Joomla or any other open source. Uh, but the, the primary key there as well is kind of reinstilling that same thing, right? Multi-factor, complex passwords, making sure they're changed, making sure only people who should have access to those things do, right? It's a running theme. It's a very simple thing to always keep in, in, in context, but it does help with every layer because these are all different ways things can get exploited um, via the internet publicly, right? So making sure you're over our secure connection, making sure that there are, you know, and this might be semi-paranoid to a point, but perhaps locking down your home internet to only certain devices, right? Um, I utilize Google's uh, Wi-Fi uh, Nest system. It's actually really helpful because it gives you an indication of how many different devices are connected to your Wi-Fi. So you know what's being connected. It took me two weeks actually to understand that I actually had a, uh, a watch laying around somewhere on one of those like smart watches that was connected the whole time. I had no idea. I didn't know what the, you know, the designation was for a device like that. So it, it, it really helped me provide some clarity on my inventory of devices that should all be connected. If you ever see something that doesn't that connects, I wasn't supposed to, I get alerts on something like that. And I can either kick them off the network or let them through whatever uh, the preference is. But those are types of the things, those are the type of things that can be helpful because someone might be driving by connecting to your home network that everyone's stuck at home, right? We're all working from home now. Um, and they may access your Wi-Fi because it's utilizing a very weak password. It's a very common name, right? Maybe someone's like, you know, kind of understanding, hey, yeah, this is a Netgear router, probably someone who hasn't reset their pass. And then they gain access and kind of see a bunch of stuff. So it, it can be really tricky. Um, but so how do we, you know, beyond just how to secure all this, right? I just talked on inventory. Well, one of those things that I also touch on is reducing what we, does, you know, what we term as an attack surface. Meaning like, okay, so how much am I willing to expose publicly or even internally um, that you know is a necessary risk. You know how do I reduce that in the event that maybe I don't know? Well, some of the questions that you one should be asking oneself as a website owner are, for example, like, do I really need this plugin? There are all kinds of cool tools. You know, they do all kinds of cool stuff. I want to try it out. You know, I have a website on my own, of course, on WordPress, and I'm always trying to test out different things. But uh, do I really need this long term? Do I just want to play around with it and make sure I uninstall it after a certain amount of time? Right. Um, but making sure you actually absolutely have a need for it so that I'm not leaving that plugin active, you know, and then potentially exposed to what may be a new vulnerability. That happens all the time, right? One of us goes on vacation, that's when the next big mass sex infection comes through and it just happens to be leveraging something I'm using. Same thing goes with themes, right? I touched on this, right? Themes, plugins, extensions, the whole lot. Anything that's a, you know, uh, an arm to your website to empower it, making sure that you really need it. If you no longer you have a use for it, don't lose it, right? Maybe a, a new theme came along, great. I should toss this old previous theme or maybe back it up and store it somewhere off site, whatever the case is. Because one of the things often people don't understand when installing all this kind of cool stuff is what happens when a vulnerability is disclosed. I think a lot of times, you know, like a, a plugins, comments or reviews can be very helpful because I talk on people saying, hey, yeah, this developer is always on top of stuff. Um, and I told him about this weird exploit thing or something wasn't working and he patched it right away. That's really good. It's actually a good thing you're looking for. But when you see the, that particular piece of software hasn't been updated in months, years in some cases, or whatnot, then that becomes, you know, um, I think not the surest way of knowing that, hey, if there is a problem, I do know that this particular developer will jump right on it. You know, I'd rather go to the guy who updated this three weeks ago than three years ago. 
Um, and some of those things also kind of help in how they develop the tool, right? Does the tool itself maybe offer its own type of security measures? Multi-factor is gonna be the most common thing here um, or limiting access. So those are things that can also provide you some better clarity as to, okay, this developer has security top of mind or a lot of cool performance-based plugins, right? CDN type stuff, help of caching that actually sometimes embed security-based add-ons or features in there because it's important too. And so those are the types of tools you maybe wanna be using instead. Um, and again, performance having you know, not much to do with security, but if you have a tool that is offering or you know providing some insight into that, that can be really insightful. Um, of course, plans for update releases. Do they have that type of history and whatnot? Maybe we already touched on that. So other things we can do, right? And you know, of course, update, update, update. Everybody tells you to update. You get emails to update. You know, your, your phone gets updates too. Um, but I think it's interesting that most people we see that come infected to us. And I think over the years, we've seen like a near 60%, um, just about, um, that whenever they come to us infected, always have outdated software for some reason, you know, right? And so a lot of times people understand, yeah, we just can't, we haven't had time. Well, I think especially if you're not utilizing some type of proactive feature, like uh, what's known as a web application firewall, website firewall. If you're not leveraging something like that, that can help offset the fact that you're probably running on a lot of old stuff. Understanding that there are limitations, right? You might be on an old server, limited resources. You've customized it, right? You've done all kinds of wonky stuff to it. We understand. Um, but oftentimes when they do get updated, this does obviously uh, you know, give indication that they're, they were out of date for a reason. There was some type of bug, something that was in there that provided an issue that needed to be fixed. And a lot of times they're security based. Um, people often just auto update their phones, right? Auto update their laptops. And I think at just about most of those cases, you'll always see security improvement, hardening improvement in there, but people just don't read through it, right? I think the same philosophy should go to your, your website. You should apply that same like, oh, I gotta absolutely update this. You know, yeah, sometimes there's cool UI improvements, but just about in every case, there's also security improvement. Um, and that's by design, right? So your extensions, even things on your server, um, what version of PHP you're running, things of those natures. I mean, speak to, you know, whomever you might be helping you in, you know, managing your server, managing your website, to have plans in place to know that, hey, if we're notified of a release, do we have a plan in place to make sure that we can update? Do we update on time? Or if we need some time to say, maybe test some stuff out, um, what are we doing to offset the fact that we're essentially exposed? Because this might be a big security patch or something that came through the, came down the pipe, all right? And so of course, supplying updates is helpful. And, but okay, again, you wanna also make sure that fully update may also still have some risk. Um, beyond the use it or lose it nature of, of plugins, always make sure, of course, you're avoiding those plugins and themes that are pirated. Again, going to that implicit trust nature of downloading something that you should absolutely know is A, taken care of, um, B, regarded in the community, right? If it's got 50,000 downloads versus 75, you know, that kind of weighs to the, the authenticity of one over the other. Uh, removing content or anything that's not in use, right? Uh, so I often see oftentimes people who come to us with an infection, we give them back a report of all the files or directories that were impacted and then they forget, I totally forgot those pages existed. I haven't touched those in months and then they purge them. That, that can maybe be more of a regular thing you do proactively, right? Um, in the event that that page may be leveraging something that's old and again, outdated. Uh, of course, limiting access on a regular basis. If you have, um, you know, employers or developers that are kind of in and out, you're just, you know, rotating the team on a general basis, making sure that those team members that are have a big role with the running of your website only can do certain things. If you've got a someone who's creating content, make sure their only ability to do anything is to post or publish content rather than going to SSH access to your server or whatnot. You know, things like that. Um, using 2FA and generally multi-factor as much as possible, wherever possible. Um, it can be a nuisance, I fully understand. Um, I've got about 16 items in my Google Authenticator list, but they're all very important. And you know, no matter how many different ways you do it, sometimes there's still always the risk that I get an alert 
somebody was attempting to log in. You know, and that's you know having those types of layers in place can be helpful. Um, using uh, strong random passwords, password ma password managers are very helpful here. Um, LastPass is something I personally have used over the, the many years so far I've been online, and they help in providing those types of passwords automatically. You don't have to think about it. You just kind of check off specific uh, you know requirements you have, whether they're uppercase, utilizing special characters, length. Um, as a you know, as different websites these days do require different things, um, and then they generate for you and store it, so you don't have to worry about memorizing eighty-five different passwords. But making sure you're not using the same password over and over is important. Um, Non-standard usernames are also a similar thing, especially if you have a common name, right? If you're Matthew Smith, you know, I know there's many of you out there. Uh, maybe leveraging something a bit more unique because. Oftentimes, common names mean common targets, right? Common CMS like WordPress become a bigger target, not because they're susceptible, it's just because they're the biggest whale in the ocean. It's, it's the fastest thing people can see. Um, applying an SSL certificate to your site. Um, I would think in 2021 that goes without saying, but just to kind of um, nail that one down a little further, you know, you wanna make sure that any data that you're receiving from anybody you know, whether it's simply an email, a, a contact, uh, you know, callback number or whatnot, um, is encrypted over HTTPS, meaning if somebody were to steal that data as it's traveling from, let's say, that visitor's computer to your web server, that it's encrypted so that if anybody takes it, they can't understand it. Um, if you're not running over HTTPS, then somebody can grab it and be like, oh, hey, I've got this guy's, you know, phone number, address, full name, that can be the start of some nefarious activity. So just some of those things can you know, have cascading events or rather cascading impacts. Um, so some of these things are helpful in making sure that some, if you're utilizing some of this, great. Um, I would try to review this list of action items to see what are you doing and that just protect your site, your server, but people as well, right? You know, this can have some impact on others. Um, now, these are some of the things we can monitor for. These are some of the things we can protect against. You know, how do we protect against it? But there's no 100,000% you know, foolproof solution on security. In some form, there's always gonna be some kind of compromise. It doesn't matter how careful I am and never using a debit card, I may still get an alert from my bank that, hey, your card's been compromised. These things happen. Um, and so it's the same thing goes with your website. You can do everything you can under the sun. Do all the great practices. But you should always be aware that there's a risk that these things just happen anyway, um, especially because you cannot anticipate what's unknown, right? Uh, you can't anticipate what very complex technique an attacker has developed to exploit 500,000 websites on WordPress, leveraging a specific plugin. And you know, we report on that all the time on the security blog. Um, so having a recovery plan in place to respond in these situations is key. So uh, this is more of a visual aid. Uh, there won't be, this won't be a very long list of things, but I think the general idea is always, of course, understanding whom do you have in place to respond to, right? So my site's been hacked, right? The same way that I know when my pipes burst, when my AC dies, who am I calling in those moments to get me to, to solve this problem? Uh, security for your website is the same thing. Spending some time more proactively to understand, okay, in my Rolodex, I know I'm gonna hit this contact every time I have a security issue on my website. It saves you time because online, time is money. Um, oftentimes, of course, time also means issues make it worse. Google may notice. Google notices, that red screen comes up, right? So time is of the essence in a situation like this. Of course, that then turns into a recovery process. You know, you know who to respond to, you know who you're gonna reach out to in the interim. Do you have backups in place? to you know, kind of understand where you're, you know, where you were at a couple of weeks ago. You shut the site down, you know, revert back to a previous version of it, you know, kind of review what the state of that site was and make improvements on a security, from a security perspective, of course. Um, review everything that happened. Often, in, in most cases, when, uh, you know, you have a security, you know, vendor such as ourselves respond to a situation like that and then recover for you. Um, we'll provide you a list of action items, or at least a very much a list of what happened that you can review, and then mitigate. Right, take those items of reviewing, go with the team, be like, hey, 
So we were obviously missing X, Y, and Z on this. We, you know, did not meet the mark here. Let's make sure as part of, you know, let's do this better, improve our processes, whatever the case may be. Um, and then like the visual kind of alludes to it. This is very, uh, you know, this is very cyclical, right? You'll mitigate and then perhaps in some due time, unfortunately, something else happens, maybe not as impactful, but just having this type of general, this, you know, recovery plan, which, you know, may be very similar for some people in a, in a business perspective. It's the same thing that goes to your website, you know, and all that goes to managing your online presence, right? Making sure that you have just the general beginnings of a, of a plan in place. So, you know, okay, I've got to hit this person, we'll recover, we'll review what happened and we'll do better. All we can do, right? Be 1% less worse the next day. Um, in any case, it's all about making sure that at the end of the day, going through all of this, that you still maintain that implicit trust with the people visiting your site, right? Uh, you wanna make sure that they come back to your site, uh, there's no issues, that they always feel comfortable, right? Um, you know, that there's never gonna be anything that is an unnecessary hurdle for them. I cannot tell you personally how many times you often get to a site that not only is slow, but then you navigate to different pages and that padlock is no longer there and I get concerned. So you don't want that, right? So at the end of the day, this is all what it, what's really what it's all about. It's not so much about you, but making sure everybody visiting your site is safe, you know, and, and there's that implicit trust. So, I mean, in reality, that's that's, a, that's as much about website security as there is without getting very much into the weeds on things. I'm hopeful, though, that this was a good starting point. Uh, it's something that gets the mind thinking about things you can or cannot do right now to help improve that process or otherwise at least give you something down the line to chase down as the year goes on. Things change all the time, all the time. So um, in any case, I will invite Adam back. Uh, of course, so I'll be helpful. I'll be uh, uh, more than available to any questions that there are. At, uh, yeah. Hey, well, thanks, Victor. That was that was really uh, eye opening and uh, serves as a really, really good baseline uh, who's not familiar with website security or how to how to implement those uh, those um, those security postures. So we do have a few questions here. Let me just throw them at you. Fantastic. Uh, All for it. First, um, Jim uh, in the chat here asks the questions. Uh, do you recommend uh, any specific WordPress security plugins? Um, so obviously, there's there's a couple of go tos, uh, um, and if you could speak to um, security plugins in general and the difference, and maybe other security postures, that I think that'd be helpful. Sure, I, I think. Um... I'll probably maybe very briefly speak on a couple of misconceptions when it comes to security plugins, right? I mean, they're helpful. I mean, uh, the Scooty brand ourselves have our own WordPress plugin that's very helpful in providing you visibility. I, I think the one takeaway I have with every single problem case I get is people just did not know there was an issue. Uh, the plugin is very helpful because not only uh, does it alert you to, of course, actual, let's say, existing infections or whatever the case may be, but just unusual behavior like, hey, um, X and Y attempted to log into your work with WP admin uh, five times in the last 30 minutes, stuff like that. that. That's unusual, and that can give you an indication of, oh, that doesn't mm -hmm. sound right. I need to do something to help maybe lock that down a little better. Other plugins will do the same. One thing I would just be asking whenever you kind of peruse what would be the best security plugin is making sure how much those plugins um, have an impact on your resources. Sometimes there are some security plugins that are CPU heavy, um, and that's because of its nature, right? Some are purely uh, like a plugin based, uh, you know, nature, and so they completely rely on resources to function. If your site is anticipating a lot of traffic, which also, of course, may invite bad noise as well. Um, it may be more prudent for you to, to, to look at it in a cloud-based option rather than a plugin because cloud-based options can kind of help consume a lot of that traffic better and your server won't see those resources dwindle as a result. Um, those will really be the two things. And I think, uh, but most plugins will always provide some visibility, but um, those that are really good may be good hybrids of offering both a you know plugin-based approach so they can detect behavior better as well as like off, like a, offering an add-on that's cloud-based so that you're not kind of like killing your own server just for the sake of security. 
Got it. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I hope that helps uh, answer your question. I put a link in there to the Sakuri scanner uh, plugin. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't. Uh, <laughs> and so we have another question here uh, from our friend Val Vesa. And uh, he wow. says, uh, he asks, what was the largest number of plugins you ever saw on a WordPress site? I personally have seen 19 plugins on a site, but more important part of that were that uh, when I spoke to this one customer, uh, about 16 of them had not been touched or used in about nine months. Um, mm. And so that kind of goes to, you know, like, I, there, are, there are cases where we've seen a lot of people leverage a lot more plugins, right? That may not sound a lot, but to me, the biggest takeaway from that is the general percentage of what was not being used or paid attention to. Um, so when you consider that 16 out of 19 not used, meaning you're only using three plugins actively, it was a very small site, but they got hacked. They were they were impacted. They were a small like um, uh, um, they were a small uh, charity organization for like a, um, a dog uh, rescues, and so you know something that small, especially that you know without any type of intent, really just beyond just providing information on how people can um, rescue dogs in the Southwest Florida area. Um, they they did not have the best you know handle on what to do when they utilized new tools. They used one, abandoned it, never uninstalled it, just left it there. So you know, just that's a case of not so much how many plugins you were using, but just how many plugins you weren't, right? Um, and that that kind of like, be the trouble. I like that quote there. It's not how many plugins you're using; it's how many you aren't. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, be, and and just to speak to that a little bit, you know, I've through the years I've been really guilty of having shiny object syndrome, and I've had more than one site where I, you know, I'm I'm installing every plugin on the .org repo, you know, all fifty plus thousand of them it seems at some points, and you know, to test different things, and I I, I always wanted to try the newest uh, plugins that were released, so I'd flip to the newest tab and just to see what was out there, see what people uh, were building. Uh, and lo and behold, you know, uh, before I know it, I have, uh, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of plugins installed on my site that aren't activated. But when you think about it, that is code that's sitting on your server that may or may not be vulnerable to uh, some type of attack vector. So yeah. really good point there. If you're not using it, get rid of it. And if you are using it, think hard about uh, if you actually need it uh, or, or not and, and then get rid of it. Um, yeah. Go ahead, yeah. No, I was gonna say, and this, this is also kind of, it seems, dumb when you think about it but like this is also the same type of philosophy you may take you know in any part of any other part of your life right like how many apps do you have in your phone but you don't actually use and and people do often for the sake of space or for any other reason do think to like remove stuff well i haven't touched this app and god knows how long i'm just going to toss that uh, but then that thinking never carries to your web environment um so it, it's really it's the thinking people do all the time it's just kind of you know, putting in a different context that then it's like your 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 practice is already there. Likely, uh, just apply it to something else, especially something more important, probably, um, and it can pay dividends along the way. Yeah, I, you know, I agree with that. I think it, it comes down to maybe having a regular audit schedule for uh, uh, your own sites, but also those of your clients to run through and just see what's happening uh, and see if there is opportunity to to strengthen uh, that that attack. Uh, um, um, posture uh, yeah. or the 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 opportunities for that. Uh, Jim has a follow up question: uh, Is deactivating a potential security concern? I don't always remove inactive plugins, but to but do but do deactivate inactive objects. It is helpful, yes. Um, and and I think it just being conscious of the inventory being there is good. Um, I will I will say in, in a lot of cases. If you if it's a temporary deactivation, right? Like you know, shiny object syndrome. Are right? you testing different stuff? So I want to deactivate this to enable that. Um, that, that. That's fine. I think in most cases we just don't want is a lot of stuff running. Um, but if you do have maybe the ability to move those objects off site, so maybe you have a backup server somewhere um, that's locked down or something, that may be better practice because then you're there's limiting file structure exposure. Like you know, if someone does happen to get in there anyway. Um, you know, don't know how much data information may be stored in the database of that plugin. Um, so 
yes, it's a good starting point um, if it's possible and you were intending to you know utilize it again. Uh, moving it off site, as we would say, would be very helpful. Um, you know, and sometimes that can just be in the form of, of the snapshot of a backup, right? You could take a backup of your site utilizing certain software, take that off site, and then you can kind of remove whatever's actually in there. I, um, yeah. I would imagine that this uh, that could also come into play with staging sites. So yeah. uh, a, a lot of hosts these days offer staging sites. Uh, GoDaddy and GoDaddy Pro absolutely uh, offer staging sites and many of our um, managed WordPress hosting plans and others. And when you have a staging site, for those that aren't familiar, it's basically a copy of your live site. And it's typically used to develop uh, the live site there on the staging site or make any changes and then push those to to the live site so you don't accidentally break anything in production. But I would, is what you're talking about, can that be accomplished on a staging site as well? Maybe absolutely. testing plugins there, keeping them active? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's good practice. I think a lot of people who do actually take um, the diligence to go through the staging, testing, and production stages of properly deploying a site, which I've seen cases where they just kind of shoot things straight to production, but um, that's you know, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's not, but in most cases, like that's just good practice because it does reduce the risk. Um, you know, it's it's just understanding that not just for functionality purposes, but you may be in the middle of this process, and then all of a sudden a disclosure comes out, and it allows you to pause in the middle of your evaluation to understand. Okay, wait. We're leveraging something. We just got news and something's exposed. We haven't gone to production yet. It's not live. It's great. We can stop here, kind of reevaluate, kind of start, you know. Um, that happens frequently, you know, and I I think especially certain times of year, um, especially around the winter time, you know, we do often see surges and spikes in the types of the in the amount of disclosures we see, right? How many different types of infections evolve. Um, so it's just being, con you know, I think beyond also understanding what you have, uh, understanding what you're using, uh, having being tapped into some type of feed that also notifies you about these things can be critical because just being told, hey, like it's no different than like you get news online, like hey, you know, Target's been exposed or hey, something's not working. Your mind's gonna go to, okay, I need to avoid this for a minute while they get it to get it together. Uh, it's going to be no different than software. So if you can tap into a number of online security sources or WordPress-based you know, news uh, outlets, that'll be helpful for you as well because um, they may provide insight as to something you're in the middle of staging and testing that you may not need to account for because this is by the minute, right? Um, by yeah. the day, we see hundreds of cases every day. Um, and uh, every now and again, we see a trend that turns into a disclosure. <laughs> so. What are, what are some of your favorite uh, um, online outlets to get those notifications of vulnerabilities in WordPress plugins? Um, I, I would, I mean, it's, you know, cooting our own horn. We do have a blog that's very, uh, very helpful for these types of things. Uh, blog We um, actually just recently uh, involved a lot of our labs and research group on that main blog. So not only do you get general new like you know, general postings or whatnot, but there's actually a lot of interesting proof of concepts there as well, if, if you're into that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I think there's also good security news out there through other, like, a, you know, just a, going on the WordPress security team, you know, kind of like uh, going off of that. Um, different other types of outlets, like, um, I think I was just looking at, I think it's code in WP.com that they had just put out like 25 simple security tricks to help you know kind of keep your website safe. I think it came out a couple of months ago, you know. So I think even just Googling WordPress security, you might just run into general development WordPress outlets that also offer security insight as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 to be truth be told, I mean, a good uh, Google search will help, but our blog does do a good job of balancing both um, new disclosures new, you know, guidance, you know, we have guides and tutorials and stuff to help, but as well as just if, if there is a new, very important vulnerability that's been disclosed, um, you know, providing a proof of concept and understanding the scope and how dangerous that particular attack may be. Perfect. Yeah. So um, one more question that we have here and uh, folks, uh, they're still on the call. Feel free to ask any additional questions you might have. Uh, but um, I want to pivot to talking about security as it relates to you 
as a freelancer. So a web designer, a developer who's actively building sites for clients. Sure. And one of the questions that came up is, uh, you know, do you have any tips for helping clients to understand the importance of a solid security plan for their sites? And, and how do you message the importance of security uh, to someone who may be non-technical um, or who just doesn't want to get into the, the weeds and might think, well, you know, security, yeah, I'll worry about that later when it's too late. Yeah, I think um, I, I think one of the things freelancers know all too well is, right, like the hours you're spending every day and very late at night trying to like just get things to work because your clients have very high asks you're in the middle of trying to build out your portfolio, right? So you're 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 not as hard line to say no. You're oftentimes saying a lot of yes. You know, I, mean, I can totally try that. Um, well, when it comes to security, when something goes south, then those hours go away because now you're spending time either trying to DIYing it, um, finding a vendor because you haven't spent the time to already put that in place. Um, I I think this is many years ago, I had a freelancer who went on vacation um, and then he was with his family, but spent half the time in his hotel room because a number of sites got infected, didn't want to have to spend the money out of pocket and, you know, was trying to DIY the fix himself until it just kept getting reinfected and he couldn't. So three things there, right? You're losing time at home, you're losing time out of pocket and you're losing time um trying to do something that just in the end gets you to the same position you were before that could have been prevented if you had put a position something in place to begin with mm -hmm. um so those are some of the impacts you don't see like oh it's an infection how bad it can be but sometimes a single site like we've seen infections where it runs like twenty thousand lines twenty thousand strings of code that i mean if you want to tackle it on your own you know if you don't like <laughs> sleeping that's great um, mm -hmm. But you know that, that it can be that bad. It can be that bad. It's not simply I, an infection is one line. No, an infection can be thousands. Yeah, um, I, I can I can attest to trying to DIY security issues or hacks on my own. Uh, quick side note story: uh, One of my first uh, internet-based businesses was a WordPress multi-site installation where I was providing sites for uh, for artists of all kinds. Uh, this was back in 2006 uh, when multi-site was not part of WordPress core. Right. No clue whatsoever about anything security related uh, on the web or uh, uh, as it pertained to websites. Well, you know, guess what happened? The install got hacked. Uh, I DIY'd it for several days in a row trying to fix things. And as soon as I thought things were fixed, uh, then I, there, a reinfection would happen. And at the time, there, were, there, there weren't the securities of the world where I could, you know, go and say, hey, can can you guys clean this up for me for X number of dollars? And uh, so unfortunately it, it didn't end well. Um, and so that I'll always remember. And that is kind of what sparked my interest in, uh, in, in, the security part of, of web development, and especially as it relates not not just to client sites, right? Because your your clients are typically running their businesses on their sites, and that's why they hire you to make these sites work for them, earn them income. Um, but if you can't communicate the value of security and something bad happens, and, and I know many, many web designers and developers who just run a lot of security baselines and never even tell their clients about it for their own peace of mind, let alone have the clients understand what the importance of it is. Uh, so uh, I think it's really important to communicate that to clients in a way that they can understand. So uh, one of the one of the ways that um, I've seen it done is you, you say your, your website is your storefront and um, your windows are unlocked right now. Uh, and, you know, let me help you lock your windows, put in a security alarm system. So if something does happen, we can get notified and remediate it uh, really quickly. Yeah, I think also helps in the transparency of that conversation. Like I think um, it, there may be, there are actually lots of conversations I end up having where people often think, you know, they kind of label security as security for all things. But I'll be very transparent and be like, look, you know, I can only help you do so much in this space. And as a developer, for example, I can only help you, you know, accomplish so many things, performance improvement, and may offer guidance on SEO and all that. But at the end of the day, I'm not a security expert. 
So I will absolutely need you to help me kind of invest in a security solution because if things go south, as often they do, like I'm telling you right now, I can't spend all night trying to fix this or DIY it. I, you know, I've got other priorities. And if, you know, let's say, you know, whether it's small agencies or boutiques or whatnot that have some type of a maintenance retainer, incorporate that because mm -hmm. that transparency of, look, I'm not a security expert and I don't pretend to be. So we're going, and part of this is going to include this. It has to mm -hmm. be because for both of our sakes, you know, this is going to be really critical if things go badly. Yeah, makes sense to me. Um, that's all we have for the Q&A here, Victor. Uh, I just want to mm -hmm. thank our attendees. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, uh, GoDaddy Pro meetups happen twice a week uh, on Wednesdays and Mondays in both the uh, U.S. Uh, Eastern Standard Time Zone and in Europe uh, in the uh, one of the UTC time zones. I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, Victor, uh, thanks for, for joining today and sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate it. And as a reminder, this will go out as a recording on the event page and also on our GoDaddy Pro YouTube channel. So uh, thanks again, Victor, and uh, everybody take care. Take care, everyone.